Oh, assalamu alaikum people, welcome back. Uh, we're just following on from those technical issues as always. <laughs> we are back with this month's uh, book lounge to discuss and review and just share our thoughts on an incredible book. Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, The New Science of Psychedelics. We have our esteemed uh, members with us, so bienvenidos a todos. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we've got a new fresh face that those of you that couldn't uh, hear the volume coming through first, that's from the UK, Atik Malik, people. A fresh, youthful perspective on all of this. And the regular of <laughs> the regulars, people, you've got Moss from Botswana, Scorpio from the States. Texas, and we've just been joined by Ibn Firnas from the UK people who's yet just setting up. So we'll see his uh, his his nowhere face full of noor shortly. All right. So till then, guys, uh, shukran for your patience. Um, right. How has it been? I know we were just getting into all of this and. Uh, all right, Ibn Firnas, I see in the name of Allah, Allahu Akbar. Look at that. What does that say? I'm with the mess. With the what? With the blessing of Allah. <laughs> Guys, how did you find this book? Let's get uh, straight into it because I know some of you, we were just sharing our thoughts and we had an... Uh, a tech issue so right how did you guys find this book was it an uh, easy read difficult let's let's take it from there and and start to unpack this so Scorpio how, how about you how have you been finding it um, I really liked how it took us on like a little journey like from where he got the inspiration to his research and then further application. So I liked how it was all set up. I liked um, that it was a pretty easy read. It had um, cited references and everything. Uh, it was just a little bit long, but um, overall easy read. And I learned a lot of new things from it. Right. Okay. And the rest of you guys, what about uh, Moss? Your thoughts on it? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So I got the audiobook vo version of it. So mm -hmm. when I went through the first reading, I was kind of all over the place. And I don't think that's a fault on the author's part. It's just I was doing all sorts of things, it being an audiobook. Okay. I was at the mall shopping, so my brain was sort of scattered. Um, but I did enjoy it more during the second reading. As Scorpio said, it is kind of long. It's got quite a few yeah. anecdotes and, and stories in it. But I think it's uh, quite impactful. And I was going through the book itself, once again, in audiobook format this morning and everything. And I think I was enjoying it the most this time. I'm not saying that everyone has to read it three times, but yeah. I, from my experiences, <laughs> From my experiences, I'm finding this read through or listen through the most enjoyable. And he's got quite an interesting sort of style, I'd say. Like in the beginning chapters, he has this sort of foreshadowing almost. He keeps talking about this O'Leary guy and how his experiment went wrong. And then yeah. later Timothy on, Timothy Leary. Actually goes... yeah. yeah, exactly. Timothy Leary. And then later on in the book, he actually goes into who this guy was who was timothy leary and yeah. and what exactly went wrong with his experiment so i found that quite fascinating it's almost as if he was writing an actual story and there are many parts of this book which don't read like they're necessarily trying to be academic he does mm -hmm. talk about the struggle with bringing in mysticism to academic research and that sort of balancing that with this materialist sort of lens of looking at yeah. things so i really found that interesting of having to balance all these things whilst going forward in his so-called research right all right yeah absolutely i i second a lot of what you're saying i i too uh often go through the uh the audible and i get the 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 paperback i try to wherever possible because i, I like listening 
and it's something you can do sometimes when especially let's say you've got to drive you've got to do something you can um and and you're right i found it quite some parts of it were quite long-winded it was um i don't know like i did feel in between there, there was you know by the time you've got to chapter three you've got he's going into the whole i feel some of it it's just all said in it could the same message is just there in in a chunk of it but he's elaborating so much about uh, and, and i guess it's useful i'm not saying it's not useful but let's say he's speaking about the lsd part and then he goes into all the history about let's say um he has that uh he has certain uh famous uh personalities that emerge and you've got um hubbard who comes and then there's this whole thing about who is Hubbard, the FBI and all these things and and like that with each character and then the, this and it's just it is quite elongated I, I did feel that as well I must say and um, yeah something that helped me actually quite a bit uh, before even getting into it was uh, watching some of the YouTube and the TED talks by Michael Pollan on the topic what about uh, you guys so we've got Ibn Farnas and uh, Atik do you, your thoughts on you know when you're going through it was it was it an easy read was it difficult was what what do you guys feel i enjoyed it, to be honest with you um it discussed a topic that's very rarely discussed within our circles um the book even states it that psychedelics is something brand new to the western world so it's not something we're aware of, aware of it in this part of the world um, so the reading was fantastic. Personally, I would read it again just to pick up on a few more sections of it to get a clear picture. Uh, it's an interesting read, uh, the history about psychedelics and the experience of the author himself as well. So I liked it. You're right, yes, yeah, sure. absolutely. And Atik, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, sure. So I found it pretty interesting. Uh, again, I mean, I second to all of the uh, kind of things that you guys have mentioned about it. What I found particularly interesting really was the whole mystical side of uh, it and how uh, people that weren't necessarily spiritual or religious, uh, quote unquote, had all these like life changing experiences and actually what the author was talking about. And one thing that struck me particularly was I must mention when I believe the author mentioned the example of a caveman if you placed a caveman in the middle of massachusetts mm -hmm. and like he walked into massachusetts and he's like oh what you then walked him back after five minutes and you ask him well what did you see he will say well i seen these like really tall things and these loud things and like cars and you but he can't he can't say cars he doesn't know what cars are tall buildings he has no idea mm -hmm. similarly the author said that what people were feeling in the experiences that they had it's it's something that they can't actually completely comprehend in words which i found fascinating mm -hmm. because i've i've, yeah. I've been to uh shrines uh, as in growing up but like uh, quite a lot in Sindh. i visit Sindh every year to like mm -hmm. a spiritual gathering and it's interesting because i see like i see like quote unquote what you would say mystical kind of uh, yeah some great things and i, I so i love it mm -hmm. personally i love the book this thought, this this quality that you this term that they term it ineffability that something cannot be put into words it's ineffable um and he mentions that when he's highlighting william james categorizing the whole mystical experience and he says that why you know what makes this so important for people and he mentions the one thing is that, so for example there's an ineffability about it there's this noetic uh knowledge that they feel that they know something now that this they need to uh, express to someone or the world or you know there's this uh, and he goes through the the kind of four characteristics <coughs> but yeah that's it's so true because this topic you know it's you think about it that the psychedelics yeah in in such a modern world um 21st century we're talking even now 2022 uh, in parts of the world that are so leading and pioneering on liberties and freedoms and innovation and yet it's such a taboo topic i mean now it's somewhat easing up again but it's it's you know it's quite 
just it's just surprising to even think that that why what is the problem with me why is like you could talk like think about it you could talk technically about anything i mean you could you could present ideas innovative ideas in business in it in medicine you know you could come up with things you could whether whether it's going to flop or not is is irrelevant but people will you will have a receptive audience like people will feel okay i mean whether it works or not is you know that time can test it but psychedelics is like ooh, you know there's a uh, uh it's a, it's such a taboo that's just crazy. I, I find that so yeah. just mind boggling. <laughs> I think I think it's fear, if anything. Uh, people are actually scared. I feel like uh, there's, there's definitely a group of people that exist uh, that if you were to if they were to take psychedelics or anything that kind of alters the mind, quote unquote, mm. they'd think they're dying. Like they'd associate that to death almost, I feel. So it's that fear that they have within them that prevents them from even exploring the idea uh which is interesting because the like it's almost someone can say it's exaggerated what the author's talking about how psychedelics can uh alleviate addictions and all of these things well if you were to talk to people about those things um they they would be in favor of them but as soon as you mention psychedelics it's like whoa no like what the hell man that's that like that can't be true that can't be right so it's this uh and it's weird. It is. It is weird. Uh, but that's how it is, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's that's. Uh, but it's it's also interesting because we learn that look, not so long ago, so many decades ago, psychedelics was the new thing. You know, they they were going in the 50s when they've come across it. They thought it's going to cure so many things. This is um, psycho psychotomimetic. It's going to give us an insight into psychosis. It'll give us an insight into schizophrenia. It's going to be it's prescribed for certain innovation. Uh, I mean, Watson and Crick, I mean, they, they, they're part of them going into the DNA is their trips on on LSD. And so it's this. Uh, and in parts of the book, he speaks about, um, I can't remember whether it's Bob Jesse or who, but uh, he's speaking to some of the um, uh, the researchers into alcoholism. Uh, and they say that they discovered, they were surprised to discover that actually uh, Alcoholics Anonymous used uh, psychedelics back in the 50s and 60s to cure people but then they buried all of this research and it was it was like he just discovered it like wow okay I didn't even know you know we're trying to cure people who are alcoholics and I didn't realize our movement had all this research in the past which they've hidden away so it was there was this explosion of this is amazing wow what is this and then it just takes a dark turn. So, yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I thought it was kind of interesting how they also talked about, like, how a lot of this was also being done in America. And at the time, um, there was they were trying to go to war, right? And so they said they mentioned how the counterculture was using LSD, developing empathy, and the government thought that maybe that was going to, you know, ruin their plans of the draft. So I thought that was kind of interesting how they wanted to put us to control people essentially yeah. by taking away um, what could equate to cognitive liberty, as they said in the book. That, yeah. That's really interesting, and can I can I just add on to Gorky's yeah, uh, point there? Uh, I'm sure uh, someone mentioned in the book that you know if everyone was to take LSD, the whole world's problems will go away uh, based on uh, this person's experience. So it's interesting because it's almost like yeah, <laughs> what would if everyone if everyone took LSD according to obviously how the what they're saying, um, the peace and harmony that it would promote between people, it's it's crazy yeah the, it's really interesting actually what you said yeah because 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 you have because um, there's a part of the book where he highlights that it's almost that it's 
as if it's a um, it's really just an attack on uh, um, it's really just an attack on uh, Republicans uh, sorry on Democrats that this whole thing they can't um, you know you can't just target them but it seems to be that these people who were taking LSD and taking psychedelics they seem to be very vocal one against the war in Vietnam two against just a lot of what seem to be some or at least some Republican policies and um, and this is almost a way of smacking back at the opposition as well so it's interesting how and that's Nixon yeah Nixon's kind of war on on drugs <laughs> It's madness how and and you see and people wouldn't really know that i feel that people wouldn't know that this is linked in any way to that it's i find that quite amazing that you see people could today have an opinion on let's say um uh, you could have an opinion on uh, right i just realized that Right, so, um, ah, what's just happened? So, if, uh, hmm, uh, are you, uh, can you guys, uh, the audio hasn't, um, it, this equalizer seems to have just stopped moving, the other one. So, I don't know, you guys can obviously hear me fine, yeah? Yeah. Of course, guys. Yeah, okay, okay, sure, that's fine. Okay, I'll just, I'm just pressing refresh on it. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting that many people may not know that this... You see, they may have an opinion today that psychedelics are disastrous, are, but they don't know how that opinion has been formed before it's influenced them. Like, who would think today their thoughts on psychedelics are most likely the result of Nixon's war on drugs? And that, when I say drugs, especially psychedelics, nobody would think that. I mean, many people may not have even, or I mean, maybe they have heard of Nixon, but maybe many people may not have, you know, in certain parts of the world that are not from America. And, and, but yet it's influenced them through um, not direct, but indirect um impact and and causation so wow it's uh, it's that was something which i found really uh just mind-boggling to think about but yeah so okay so guys what, what so what what are certain things that really stood out for you in in this whole discussion yeah, Mufti, before we go forward, I'd just like to run something by you, since you are the Islamic scholar on our panel. Okay. And sort of what, what we just mentioned about the whole war on drugs and Nixon, but coming at it from a different sort of angle, so to speak. Sure. So a, a lot of Muslims, I guess, um, and obviously you are not of this opinion, they say psychedelics are haram because they liken this to intoxication. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously as we have read the book we know that going on a psychedelic trip is nothing like intoxication we're talking yeah. about empathy we're talking about being averse to war and harming others so that's basically the opposite of um, intoxication but i wanted to ask you from this perspective when we say khomr for example mm -hmm. which is the arabic word for alcohol mm -hmm. uh, i think i read back in the days it's called khomr because it like clouds your judgment clouds your head and so you know like the khimar which is what you cover your head with so muhammir and you can comment on this having studied arabic longer than myself mm -hmm. psychedelics don't cloud your mind if anything they Expand. unravel a layer and allow you to exactly and see things that you've never seen before and you don't even have the vocabulary to describe mm -hmm. them which is you know why we would say that you know this thing of psychedelics being intoxicants okay people have that opinion that's them that's fine mm -hmm. but with all due respect it seems to be a misunderstanding and it doesn't even make sense if you look at the root word of you know yeah. or 
That's very, uh, you know, amazingly said. And I think it's a val super, um, uh, really, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the point. Because, look, even in the book, there's this whole discussion on when they're trying to arrive at a name for psychedelics. And you guys probably remember they first begin with psychotomimetic and then um, Huxley and is it... Um, Huxley and uh, is it Osmond or no? What's what's his name? Um, that that are having this discussion that we need to. This is basically it's it's misleading this name because Huxley's writing to which psychiatrist is it? Um, but he he when they're having the discussion and they're saying well psychedelics ain't uh, sorry psycho psychotomimetic is a misleading name because it's giving people a wrong impression. So. And then they, they come up with uh, psycholytic, which is about mind loosening. And Huxley comes up with another one, uh, uh, like some Greek version. And when he writes to the other person who, who twists his verse, his poem, and he says something like, um, to, he says, to, to fathom hell or be angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic. And, and so he comes up with the word psychedelic, which, which means mind expanding. And that's what psychedelics actually means, like soul, psych, psyche being the soul or the mind. And, and from the delic is from the part of expanding. And so it's not about clouding the mind or covering or sealing, you know, yukhamir. Because this definition, ma yukhamir al-aqal, that what kind of puts a like a shroud over the aql, over the psyche, over the, the, the... This does, if anything, the opposite. Um, just from a linguistic definition. And it's nothing like um, alcoholism. In fact, you know, there's another book, maybe in the future, not right now because we've just done one on psychedelics, but in the future, we, you know, it's a book maybe we could look at. There's a, a book by David Nutt, who's a British scientist, brain scientist, neuroscientist, and he's worked for the government and he's done great work on alcohol uh, where he's really critical of alcohol and he speaks about and, and in fact he was he was sacked from the government he, he was on some kind of uh, government body or government back body and where he made the statement that alcohol uh, is far more dangerous than psychedelics and MDMA and so they, they warned him to remove his straight statement and he said, I won't, and they sacked him. And he said, but I'm just saying what the science says, that you guys, how can you have alcohol sold in every shop where alcohol is responsible for at least six different cancers? It's responsible for um, one of the leading number of deaths worldwide, according to the WHO. I think it's categorized as the fourth leading, um, you know, cause of, of death worldwide. It's it's responsible for thousands of deaths every year, especially within Britain. Um, he, he said that if you take Britain as an example, he said there won't be a household that does not have a member of the extended, so three generations. He says they won't have an, a member of the extended family that has not been uh, badly affected by alcohol. And he said, yet despite this, it is legal, it is readily available, it is encouraged almost. One could argue the way it has so much of a platform to, uh, you know, for people. And he said, and... Uh, it's just reckless and that that's a fascinating discussion in itself and he has this book called drinking um i was actually going through some of the audio version of it and i was going through some of his lectures they're available on youtube so uh and what he actually argues for is that it's very fascinating just as was well, just to close that note he says that every substance throughout time has been modified especially in recent years so he says even water he says, like, you've got sparkling water, mineral water, waters with vitamins, water with... But he said ethanol. Ethanol has not been replaced. Like, why not? He says, he argues that we have the scientific means to replace ethanol with something that may give some positives. Because he speaks about what are the positives of alcohol. He says, well, the social drinking, we, it's a social glue. Like it allows people to remove some inhibitions and become more friendly. 
but then it's a slippery slope it gets into the the dangers of it and it becomes it's highly it's um addictive for certain people but also uh they they're wired in a way like they can't predict like you don't know like let's say we all took uh alcohol some of us may be predisposed to alcoholism and the rest of us don't become alcoholics, but the others do. And this is seen in animals that consume uh, ethanol because animals that eat from certain fruits that have been fermented and they get drunk. And, and monkeys are a good example who've become alcoholic. So there's a lot of studies done on monkeys, chimpanzees and alcohol. So the harms of alcohol are clear. They are abysmal, cataclysmic. They are, you know, it's the leading death one of the leading causes of death worldwide amongst the amongst the leading causes it is responsible for at least six different cancers it is responsible for alcohol poisoning it is responsible for uh the breakdown of relationships it is responsible for that, that it is a universe apart from psychedelics there has never been a death reported from directly from psychedelics now Maybe there's been certain cases where people have, for example, been taking cocaine. Taking, I know there was a case that's in Europe where a person had cocaine, alcohol, and took a psychedelic, and he and there was a death. But that, that that's like a whole dangerous concoction, and and some people. But just psychedelics, uh, like mushrooms. You know, you've never heard of somebody who's taken mushrooms and died. You've never heard of somebody who, I mean, ev like this is, I'm not just saying this is a whole, you've never heard of somebody who's taken mushrooms and gone on a rampage. Like they don't, these things don't happen. You've never take, heard of somebody who's taken mushrooms and become a bad person. I mean, if anything, they, their love increases, they, you know, their empathy increases, they don't want to participate in wars, they want to be, they usually feel they have a deeper connection with God, they want to help humanity, they want to help people that are struggling, I mean, it's, sure, and, and you know, just to be fair, he does, in you know, in the book, he cites the John Hopkins study, often the the harvard with the timothy leary and it's a really popular study and he does mention that look there were cases where people after it uh which they didn't include in the results their relationships broke down but that's not uh, a direct cause in the sense like when people get alcoholic and they for example go home and beat up their spouses it was more in the sense that because they newly found a purpose in life they felt that they weren't no longer compatible um, with their current relationships. And just to be fair, that, that, that has happened. They do cite it in the studies. But it's not the same. It's not an abusive way. You know, it's, it's a realization. It's like if somebody suddenly followed their dreams and they realized they became an artist or they became a traveler and they realized, you know, I've kind of... I'm on a different path and it's just not working. That happens all the time in relationships. It's not something, you know, so, yeah. So I think it's a good point to say when people make an analogy and a comparison of psychedelics within the Muslim community and alcohol, it's not even apples and oranges. It's like saying something like, apples and guns <laughs> you know it's like this there's, there's a such a mismatch of the categories and the harm that alcohol brings but that said i will caveat that as i always have and, and by saying that look if if people believe it's haram that's absolutely fine they can that's their personal choice and they should not then take it they should not follow that path um but for those who, you know, th those scholars that feel it's not haram and people who follow that opinion, that's for them. So it's OK. You know, people, if you are somebody that does not uh, believe in it being permissible, then it's not for you. And you that's fine. You know, you, you don't need to be worried about what other people believe because everybody's entitled to the, their own way. You know, their, their understanding in life. So, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah just so back at you guys i mean so yeah the 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 the, the studies <laughs> the, the hopkin study at harvard and uh yeah what what, what were your thoughts on it people 
sorry, who was Can that? I just make one point about the like the the pushback against psychedelics? Yeah, yeah. Of like course. uh like I you know from the book and just like my own understanding, I can see like uh, it's against the war. So, you know, decisions are that's because people think it are anti-war. It's against uh, they might have seen it as a threat to economy. I think he mentioned that in the book as well. Yeah. That you know people might the, like the hippie culture was it like anti-work. Um, so I can understand like the pushback and alcohol. I mean, it is a little different. I mean, like in America, we did go through like a prohibition period. Yeah, and, yeah. You know now it's like now there's big businesses behind it. I'm surprised. Is there any culture in the world that actually um, is pro psychedelic? And, you yeah, know, like where it's like Absol- normal thing. absolutely. I mean, you see the ancient cultures, the very ancient. Uh, so you get a lot in South America. You'll have a lot of the the, the what has been part. You see, this is the thing. It's interesting. Sometimes you see we have an opinion, which is fine, but we it's it's not easy, right, for people to pause and think well. I wonder where my opinion came from. And you think, well, you know, that doesn't that, you know, somebody may say, well, I don't think that makes any sense. Where does my opinion come from? Uh, and actually it does, because it's like, you see, right, what what helped you form an opinion? Because because there's going to be factors that you are aware of and there will be factors that you're not aware of. There will be a lot of things that you're not exactly uh, so clued up about that what led to this influence. Um, So, for example, the political backdrop whilst growing up, hearing other things. So this war on uh, psychedelics by uh, Nixon, where he declared Timothy Leary, who is a Harvard professor, to be the most dangerous man in America. I mean, that's bizarre. A professor you know, is the most dangerous man in America. And, you know, it's 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 crazy that when, when you're living in a world that claims to be very pro-human rights and the most dangerous man in the country is a university, the most prestigious university in America, Harvard, he's a professor there. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that's not a, that's not a bad world <laughs> where it's, it's that's the most dangerous man of in the entire country. It's not a uh, a madman going around gunning people down like all these tragedies. It's not a terrorist blowing up buildings and killing innocent people. It's a professor who's academic and writes books and gives lectures. He is the most dangerous man in the country. I mean, that, yeah, I'd take that. I'd take 10 of those any day. So, I mean, that's... Uh, so, so this... And then Nixon, what he does is he... His government... And they, to consolidate that, they make several treaties with other parts of the world to to back them on this and to support the prohibition in their country. And so many people are still victims of that without knowing it. And you see, one of the things they speak about in the book is when the the um, the Spanish, um, you know, imperial forces had gone to. To South America to colonize it, and one of the th- and they suppressed the sacred medicine, they suppressed the mushroom, and they suppressed these things because they found them. They thought of them to be satanic, and it's interesting yeah. because they thought it's blasphemous, and because you see one of the translation uh, of the uh, in the ancient Mayan cultures of the mushrooms was flesh of the god so or of the gods and that's also the exact same thing you've got for the um <laughs> bloody hell, what what is it for the you, you know the oh, <laughs> god i can't I, is it the mushroom you know the what, what, what do they give the catholics the you know, no, the, the, the communion, the communion. Yes. exactly. Yes. So so that the whole uh, the, the very same thing, the transfiguration of Christ is, you see, where they're giving you the communion. It is also the flesh of Christ. It is the, you know, the wine and you're taking um, the communion. This is meant to represent the, the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ. So it's the flesh of the gods. And 
in many ways, when they saw that, oh, th these guys have something they call the flesh of the gods. So what's their one? But their one is quite chaotic because it's unmediated. You just, it just takes you to God. And your one has to go through this ordained priest. And it, it just requires faith because, you know, when, when, you, when you take uh, the, the Holy Communion, nothing happens to you. You know, you, you take, uh, you drink a bit of the wine and you take that and, and fine. It's exactly the same. It's just, you just ate a, uh, uh, you know, like a cracker. You haven't actually done anything. It's just a faith that, oh, this is, you know, the, 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 the body of the Jesus Christ is, is kind of coming into my body and it's becoming. It's just a, a faith thing. It's not actually happening. Whereas when you take these fruits, I, mean, I would say fruits, but not fruits. But when you take this fungi, you go off and you have, it doesn't require faith. It's experienced. So for hundreds of years, he mentions in the book how they suppressed and these practices carried on secretly in South America until recently they kind of, I suppose with independence, they have, it's, it's part and parcel. I mean, in all, many of the South American countries in Mexico, in Peru, in all of the, they have, a, in, in many of them, they have a lot of these ceremonies and it's part and parcel. People, children grow up and they're given ayahuasca and they're given all these, it's, it's considered very normal. It's considered healing. It's not considered a drug. It, it's considered, part and parcel of that society it's not i mean society that kind of their way of life yeah yeah and it's interesting because he mentions um you know you had uh r wasson r gordon wasson going down to mexico and where he meets uh what's her name maria sabina and he asks her to to give them this this holy uh this this mushroom and uh, and she does, and and it changes, and this, and really, this is the beginning of, you know, he is so, you know, and and he's a banker, and his life changes. Yeah. You know, he's on this mission that we need to, we need to tell the world about this. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I mean, right. It's interesting as well that she, her life is turned upside down, actually, and she regrets it, doesn't she? She, I think they burn her house and everything. Yeah, I like, I think... Article, the, the article that gets released, people get aware of it, and then that obviously uh, makes people travel down yeah. uh, to her, sort of to her, basically. And that's what causes it. I think when she gave the little secret away, she thought that they would protect it uh, but it obviously had the opposite effect for her and that's what's caused the issue but as you were mentioned before um for psychedelics this is sort of my opinion when i was reading the book so psychedelics don't follow the narrative in some ways uh, so they help you like develop a mindset that sees through all of that that's probably the real reason that they're considered dangerous uh, and as you know psychedelics sort of make you have different ideas mm -hmm. and sometimes different ideas can be considered dangerous ideas yeah. uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's prohibited and because psychedelics encourage you to think for yourself and I think it was the church that yeah. uh, banned it first after the church banned it obviously I think they may have banned it as you were saying probably because of the Christ that you were saying because of the wine and also because and also because of what they perceived like you see when somebody goes into this experience that they probably thought he must be possessed that you know this is the devil this is you know it's interesting that people who are anti psychedelics imagine you could you could see the two camps from history to now and you realize where you're actually standing in the company of who and which sides are which side? I mean, you'd be standing in the company of the conquistadors and in the company of the church of the past and the company of the Vatican and, and these kind of demonic priests and these people like Nixon who are just these kind of like corrupt politicians. And 
this is and on the other side you just have these shamans and hippies and you know that this is if you if you imagine we could hypothetically see who our company who are you know what company are we in when it comes to our opinion on psychedelics um would be surprised <laughs> would be like damn am i in that group uh, who wants to be with these people and that that's very telling you know, somebody. There was a comment in 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 the comments saying, "Mufti hasn't mentioned anything about long term effects." Well, well, read the book, buy the books, and read the literature of the what long term effects, what long term of uh, th these fungi and these things are naturally found in in Mother Earth. They're not. This is not you know something dangerous or um, poisonous or things like that i mean what long term uh, effects are you speaking about somebody said what well, weed has long term effects this is weed is not psychedelic nobody's talking about weed um, they're talking about we're talking about psychedelics in this book so this this book uh, the new science of psychedelics it's speaking about uh, those things which are to do with the path of consciousness. Weed has nothing to do with that. Such so people shouldn't mix up the, the conflate weed with things like this. Um, even if it does give, maybe to some people it stones them and it may give somewhat of a slight, um, maybe psychoactive, I, I guess it is psychoactive, but not psychedelic in the psychedelic sense. So there is a difference in psychoactive drugs and psychedelic drugs. So, yeah. And drugs is a horrible uh, word. Uh, I, I say drugs, but, you know, paracetamol is a drug. Caffeine is a drug. So it's not a nice... Because once again, it's the language used by Nixon and his government on the war on drugs, saying that this is... Um, you know, it's all propaganda. It's like uh, I was listening in that... I mentioned David Nutt earlier on, and uh, although it's not from this book, but he says as well, he says, you see, one of the things they did was when they needed uh, that popularity again and they, he declared war on psychedelics. Nixon did, his government. But also, he says it's around that time and uh, just before when um, he goes into the whole background of why the FBI, you know, that they needed a new project and, and they declare, all of a sudden, they rename cannabis marijuana because and link it to the Mexicans and it's an immigrant problem and and get a huge amount of funding to condemn it because prior to that they just called it cannabis and it wasn't exclusively an immigrant problem but the, it's just interesting how much of our opinions are subconsciously influenced by politics like we might think oh what no I have this opinion because it's actually just me but hmm you'll be surprised that you see we as creatures uh, much of our behaviors and, and and thoughts are mimetic, like we imitate people. You know, monkey see, monkey do. We uh, we have we want things that other people want, and we think well we want them because we like them. But actually, even our likes are often determined just by what people like, and it's happening subconsciously. It's not happening as a conscious process. So we dislike things people dislike. And so we're not aware often about, the, you know, if you get tip of the iceberg, the, apart from the tip, everything else is the unconscious mind. And so much is going on there that we don't know why we uh, like certain things, why we dislike things. We think we know, but when you go into deep uh, analytical introspection, you realize, well, hmm, actually, you know, a lot of my thoughts or my wishes have been influenced by just groupthink. Like I've just, the group has held this belief and I've subscribed to it. And, and one of the key people who's done a lot of work on this in the past was René uh, Girard. Um, he was also a psychologist. And But yeah, coming back to this. So yeah, uh, wow, what a, what a discussion though. This is, uh, yeah, what, what, what are the interesting thoughts would you like to share about about this? Guys? So what I find what I found pretty interesting, uh, in addition to everything you've said, really, is when the author spoke about the trips that people have. So you know, you have a good trip or a bad trip, uh, irrespective of whether you've had a good or a bad. You know, some people have a, have a bad. When I say bad trip, it's like a bad experience on psychedelics. The author 
explains it in uh, great depth. It's actually very clear. Um, regardless of what you have, both camps still found that after post psychedelic, post the experience, they found somewhat of a profound, they would describe it as a profound experience and they'd have positive effects irrespective. So they'd have like an afterglow, I think they called it. Oh. And this after this afterglow, uh, quote unquote, is what is, is, you know, that's pretty interesting. Uh, of course, it's not nice in the moment to have a kind of bad experience. But yeah. that's where set and setting comes yeah. in, where the author mentioned the use of set and setting, you know, ensuring that you're in a safe mm. environment. And uh, certainly in other cultures right now, they do have uh, kind of private institutes in place where they are, uh, you know, you, you have a guided psychedelic experience almost. So, mm. you know, our kind of understanding of it is, oh, yeah, you're just going to get some, I don't know, mushrooms. And just... So it really depends on the set and setting. Yeah. Um, you're right. And that's... Well, well, and I think that's Hubbard speaks a lot. I think that may have actually been his term, but Timothy Leary uses it a lot as well. He mentions in the book, the set and setting are so important to um, to the experience, because in the beginning, I think they were doing it all in these white labs. And, <laughs> you know, they were doing it with these white coats on and like scientists. And I think it's Hubbard who uh, comes in and he's like, Oh, no, <laughs> let's let's have some music. Let's have dark eye, you know, like cover the eyes. Yeah, let's yeah. let's let's have a comfortable setting. Let's, you know, bring nature like he hands somebody a bouquet of this. In fact, he mentions he hands one person a bouquet of roses and and he says that he says, make it die. And like and, and he says that and in his hands, it just dies like to him. And he says he says, now bring it back to life. It's coming back to life. It's, he says, it's blossoming again. And he sees the roses blossoming. And, and he's just speaking about the, 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 you know, the power of the setting. And yeah. I thought I that was all... a really good... Uh, go ahead. No, no, no. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, that's okay. You I, go I, ahead. I, uh, Scorpio, I just noticed that your mic, it's, it's quite... Just, what a mic go for ahead. this discussion. Please. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's absolutely psychedelic in its experience. It's it's tripping oh. right now. <laughs> that mic is, is is on a journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. You yeah, were saying please sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Please. Oh, your mic's I was just talking oh, about yeah. Yeah, you're back. I was just talking about the set and the setting, um, how a lot of people were talking about how it should be like sort of overseen medically. And I did notice that there was one study that said that a lot of people were having panic attacks mm. after um, and the researchers were a little bit over enthusiastic. So they didn't <laughs> yeah. like they didn't include that part in mm. the actual research paper. So yeah. I thought that was a little bit interesting and I thought it's yeah. nice that they brought it up now so that more people can be aware of that and so yeah. more people have that proper setting and have it overseen by um, professionals. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think, you see, I think this is the key point that, um, you know, what Atik was saying as well about this, what people call the bad trip. And I think this is what they mention in the book Hubbard when he changes the set and setting and he tries to say to people that, look, if 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 you find yourself uh, fr intimidated by something, go towards it. Like he's, he says that, look, um, if you see yourself uh, feeling all of a sudden scared, embrace it and and you'll find that it will go away. And you see, it, there's a, I suppose it's a way of looking at it that, the, you see, the way I, w I would agree with those people that there's n no such thing really as a bad trip. But sure, it may be a, you know, a um, an anxious experience at, certain, at a certain point. But it is the because of it being anxious, because the person doesn't know what's happening and they, they panic. And the pan, it's like you're in water and sure, you know, maybe you're, you're not a great swimmer, but you're OK. Now you're in water and you panic. Now, the panic is what is 
is sinking you. It's not so much you or the water per se. It's it's the panic. Like you're you you're, you're panicking, and so if you calm, you restore some calm to to calmness to you, it disappears. It becomes quite tranquil and calm again. It's like. Like right now, let's just say, as a hypothetical experiment, let's say I was to induce, attempt to induce anxiety. I was, oh my God, oh my God. And I was like, to, to, to induce this, I'm sure it would have, uh, it would certainly have, I mean, if I was to put on the, you know, check my pulse, it, it would have a physiological reaction. I would actually start freaking out a bit. Uh, Absolutely. But on psychedelics, that could be so much more exponential because, the, and I get it, that people won't know what's happening sometimes. Like they think, what the hell's happening? <laughs> because reality is, is dissolving and that's never happened before. So the, the self sometimes dissolves and you're like, what the hell is happening there? And so if a person thinks, look, it's okay if they if they made, you know, in a guided experience, if they're told, look, it's okay. It doesn't matter what you feel is happening. Embrace it. You're absolutely fine. Nothing is happening. We are here. It's like they say in the setting, you know, that uh, in the Harvard, uh, uh, the John Hopkins uh, project, and they, they were telling people and even after that, look, we are here for you. You know, if you need anything, if you need water, if you need this, you're absolutely safe. There's nothing to worry about. Uh, don't feel at any point that, oh, my God, you, you, you even if you feel, oh, my God, am I dying? You're not. Yeah, it, I liked how they did say they did say that um, if the guide would say that, you know, don't worry about your physical body at all. We're here to take care of it. Of Nothing that. is happening yeah. to you. Then they would sort of <laughs> get over that. But mm. they need that. Mm. Um, they 100%. Need that. Because I, I thought I that's such they, a. Yeah. I think they, they, you know, the experience that they have, they, they're almost having an ego death, you know, yeah. and it's like some people have this ego death and it's when they see themselves die almost, like you said, you know, they absorb uh, it or they kind of just embrace whatever comes to them. So if, if people are scared of death per se, they may see themselves even dying or feel that they are dying, which is always, uh, I mean, what do you do in that moment? Of course, uh, one kind of will may, you know, may panic or, uh, depending on how you are in your temperament, I guess, in your nature, which is another interesting thing uh, than Mufti really is, you know, it's important for us to know really that if we are anxious and depressed or going through mental health illnesses or have mental health um, symptoms, you know, of, of things that aren't so positive, um, we certainly should refrain from, from that because it's only going to... Um, damage you know damage that further for us i feel so it's really important to be in a good place and to, to really reap the benefits of psychedelics the, for psychedelics you mean right okay Absolutely. you see i i my thoughts on it would be slightly would different my thoughts on it would be that it should be guided it's not so much about you yeah i mean if you have obviously that so from what i've read even in this book they highlight um at a certain point that look if a person has psychosis and a history of that kind of mental health, like schizophrenia, like categorical, really, you know, like dangerous mental health. I don't mean by, because nowadays mental health is kind of very loose. Like people say, oh, I'm depressed. That's mental health. Um, or somebody could just be feeling down and they, they might say, well, you know, he's going through some mental health issues. Some people use the term very lightly. So so as to include almost everybody into mental health. I don't mean in that, but clinical not just clinical but very categorical things like schizophrenia psychosis where people already are detached from reality like they are uh, so schizophrenia for people you already hear voices like normal people i, I mean i said but people in a normal day-to-day -day setting they hear voices in their head telling them i don't just mean your voice like they'll hear a stranger's voice telling them to do things and they'll do it like they'll be like go and stab that person be like, but I don't want to, but no, go do it. Be like, oh, okay. And 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 you, you have these kind of things going on. And so, or self-harm or people who have uh, split personalities or they're going through um, bipolar. And sometimes people who are on antidepressants, uh, that can be very dangerous because they, these SSRIs, they, you're chemically already altering your brain. And if you take something that... Uh, 
like, you know, also alters your consciousness. It could be very dangerous. So things like that, of course, I th uh, th that kind of stuff they mention in the book as well. It's it's very you know it's it could be it could it could be potentially very dangerous for people like that. But that's the same as saying you see to me, that's a bit like saying like gym. It's like the gym can be amazing, magnificent for people. But if somebody's got there's something like something's very dangerously wrong with their spine, and they decide to I'm going to go to the gym and start squatting, and it's that 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 could be fatally dangerous for them so it's not it's sure you know if somebody's got already a dangerous condition then that's different but for the vast majority of people they won't really be in that category of like schizophrenia or psychotic or on antipsychotics or on antidepressants um the what i would say so as uh, yeah Clearly, people that are in that kind of category should avoid this kind of stuff altogether categorically. But other people, I would say it's more about, first of all, it's not for everyone. And for those who it is, who are interested, it's more about that guided setting. That's very important. Um, I think it's that, to me, is is one of the most important things. Because, you know, somebody just... Somebody sitting in a room, I think somebody s said in a comment, but we, you know, what Scorpio was saying earlier on as well about looks, you know, people panicking and having these and not knowing what to do because it's all so real. You know, if a person thinks they're dying, it's very real to them. It's not just, they don't just, you know, this ego death. Uh, the ego death is incredibly scary. It's not something which is taken lightly. It's not like, uh, you know, it's not adrenaline. You know, some people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, you go on a roller coaster and it's scary. Oh, let's do it again. It's it's not like that. It's like an ego death. And it's it's incredibly, it can be terrifying. But, it, you know, it's, it's, it, people go through it. And then there's, there's this, they're in a different maqam altogether. So, um, but being in a setting is important because if a person isn't guided, they don't know what, what's going on. They don't know how to react and they could freak out and... And it's just, you know, you could take something, it's it's like saying, you know, you're going swimming in the sea, but you don't know how to swim. You've never swam before. Should you do this in a gui with a gui in a guided uh, experience or should you just go off on your own? And sure, maybe nothing will happen. Maybe you'll just go to the sea and you'll just paddle about and you'll come back. But maybe you might, the waves start drifting you out and then you don't know how to swim. And, you know, it could be, I mean, maybe you won't drown, but it might be an absolute, you know, disaster of an experience. So, yeah, I think those things are important. It's not, um, you know, it's not, I, I don't know, my take, I don't know how you guys feel about that. My take is this is not recreational. Yeah, I don't know how, how you guys felt after maybe reading the book. Yeah, I, I felt like it's. Go on, brother. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, the book, I think it sort of presents it as a medical use. Uh, I think nowadays that's what they're using it as. Medical? Uh, Would you say it pre presents it as medical or more about a spiritual? Spiritual and medical. That's what I feel like okay. from the book anyway. Right. Um, medical, why? They don't call it drugs. That's that word drugs. When we use it, we assume yeah. it with other drugs. Uh, they, so I've come across people using it as... As just a medical as medicine yeah yeah yeah, medicine. yeah. Medicine. but just uh, to be clear when when you're saying they're using it uh in a medical sense you mean in a healing sense or you mean in a clinical sense both it could be because if because clinical, if, if, clinical is for medicine. clinical is like they are the book is guiding towards patients and the the ill I felt they were actually taking it away from that. I felt that they were saying we this has opened up to the, one open it to the world, but about healing and about spiritual and like you don't have yeah. to be a sick person to need this. You could be a normal person and this could help you. That that's the kind of the the, the, the you know, not the impression. That's what I was kind of um uh, was finding. I agree with you there. Uh, I, I feel like it was, and in regards to recreationally using it, I feel the, what I got from the book was it was almost as if take 
take it at least once to experience the mystical side, the kind of spiritual side of 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 what it is you wanna, uh, what it is it can show you, or kind of what you can learn from it. And then if I mean, and that that's kind of that experience alone will be enough to for you to be guided on kind of what direction you want to take or to gain some clarity. That's mm. that's kind of what I got from the book. So I agree definitely. I, yeah. I don't think it's I don't think it's clinical. Um, I, I don't feel it's clinical at all. And by I mean, recreational, what I meant, just to be clear, is it's not something like the book wasn't necessarily speaking. Uh, this is how I understood it, that they weren't uh, they were advocating it, but they weren't advocating it as a, hey, have fun in the in the party sense. Why don't you party? Why don't you? Mm. It was more about growth. It was about mm. healing. It was about developing. It was like a very mature it wasn't like a kid's, hey, you know, let's have fun and party. It wasn't that kind of a, they weren't, that's not at all the kind of take I was gathering. I mean, sure, they mentioned some people do it like that. Like they take LSD like that. Some people, the hippie era, they were doing that. But the book, even the author who takes psychedelics himself in it and he's trying to uh, experience, he's, he's, you know, they're all very mature people and they're, they're not like kids and they're not saying that take it in a, they're saying this is life changing. It's going to, you know, hopefully you'll expand your horizons in life. You'll have a deeper outlook. You'll, th that's the, the kind of flavor that I was I think they called it like the betterment of well people or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's it. So I liked that phrase. Hmm. Yeah, that that was a, a good phrase, yeah. Betterment of well people. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What what about Moss? What about you? You've been uh what, what was so anything that was really um that stood out for you in the book or certain features or points? Yeah. Yeah, um, when we talk about recreation, isn't there a point in the book, I don't recall exactly who said that, but when the author went to meet one of those, um, one of those guys was very particular about vocabulary and nomenclature, and he's like, I don't like the word uh, recreational, or I have a distaste for it. And, I, think it was um, I think it was shrooms. Uh, yeah. yeah, is it yeah. Stamp yeah. Stammeroff yeah. or something? Stammeroff or yes. sta he, he, so he, something like that. No, yeah. I think he goes. He goes to see the other guy, I think, and he says to him, "He's in this like, yeah. really nice techie, well, really nice house in the mountains." Yeah, and yeah. And he was like, yeah, "Don't call it shrooms," and he was like, <laughs> yeah. "Call it mushrooms." I, I, I <laughs> like the term shrooms, but <laughs> yeah, I did. I do remember that. He says, but, "But he had a really particular dislike towards it." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I found that interesting because if you look at the word recreation, I mean, that sort of implies you're making yourself anew. You're coming out as a new oh, version of right. you. Okay. So oh, speak. wow. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, if, but the thing is, in the popular sense of how we use it to it today, we don't really, I mean, maybe at the back of your mind, you know, that's what it means, but you're just talking about, I don't know, getting high or losing mm. yourself or something like that. So I guess that's the distinction that needs yeah. to be made between what the word actually means versus what we have made it out to mean in modern parlance, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah, I think that sort of distinction is very important. And I think just to bounce off what everyone's been saying, it's not, you know, something that you just take on a Friday night to quote unquote, have fun. And I think there's also a point in various points in this book where they talk about people who have taken psychedelics and then they want to get that same feeling that they had when they took it the first time, but they can't because each trip is sort of different. And yeah. so, yeah, it doesn't follow through with the usual dopamine sort of release and the dopamine mm. rush that we get when we do other things like, well, not just drugs, but, yeah. you know, if you play, play video games, for example, you had fun the first time, you'll have fun maybe the second time you're going through the story or something along that line. So... It's definitely psychedelics. Definitely don't fit the category of it, it's well, at least in my opinion. After it's quite it. anarchical, yeah. isn't it? The the structure. Exactly. There's there's a there's an inherent unpredictability about it. I think this is what really bugs people. That you, I think this is what really bugs a lot of the the the, the you know the, even the rational thinkers and the scientists of the West and. And this is what bugs a lot of them, 
when it comes to psychedelics. I think it's the inherent unpredictability that they just don't... It's, you know, if you split the, let's say, thinking and the world into Dionysian and Apollonian, where you're going to have this very structured uh, Apollonian side, whether people want to say side of the brain even, but uh, this way of thinking, structured, logical, mathematical, this whole, everything, this procedures, structures... And then Dionysian, which is very about almost like expression, art, uh, you know, that, that kind. It's chaos, but it doesn't have to be harmful, but it's chaos and you, you've got complete order. And the thing about psychedelics is it's definitely Dionysian. It's not, you know, and, and I think that scares a lot of people. It doesn't because they because you, you're right. It's like even somebody could say let's play a game well you know exactly what's going to happen you know sure we're going to have fun somebody could say oh you know uh, let's listen to music let's people smoke drugs they, they know exactly what's going to kind of happen i mean sure maybe something as a one-off they they have a bad experience but usually people know oh i'm going to do this i'm going to get this relaxed feeling i'm going to do, get stoned i'm going to just go to sleep i'm going to you know they they know exactly what's uh, let me relax. Let me take a hot bath. I know exactly what I'm going to go through. But let's take some sacred medicine, some psychedelics. And there's no idea. You know, you open the door. You've got no idea today what's going to be behind the door. <laughs> that's, that's like crazy, isn't it? When you think about it, it's like, it's, it's, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and it's actually the what, what, what they actually experience uh, um the experiences that are noted in the book, which is what I find really interesting. I'd love if you could, uh, you know, kind of elaborate on that. Really, what, what did you what did you find with all these people? For example, one uh, one guy was saying that to him it was almost as if he's seen <laughs> the creation of the universe. Of course, they're like yeah. quote unquote absurd things to say, you know, in like a town setting, uh, and there's nothing to prove whether or not i mean the fact of the matter is it was, it was in it, in his imagination nevertheless it was the experience that he felt and the profoundity of that uh, which see, i found yeah yeah the, you see there's the thing that they cite which i really liked and he quotes it quite a bit throughout the book and he refers to william james who's like the father of psychology um and and he quotes his uh, how to define a mystical experience and it's it's it is a very and he because he has this discussion in the book about is it just you know well people say well it's just in your mind you know you just imagined it and why does it why does it not work that way you see because right now i could let's say i imagine something or like i have a dream let's say i have a very vivid dream but the, the experiences are never like that the, the people that have the experiences never, they know what a dream feels like and they never equate exactly. it to a dream. And there's this profundity, but there's this very realism of it. Like they feel, no, I know what a dream feels like. And this was mm. incredibly real. Absolutely. Uh, and also they feel that, that, you see, the thing about a mystical experience, and he takes this from um, William James, this noetic quality that they feel that the experience bestowed onto them some form of knowledge or understanding. And this could be qualitative. It doesn't have to be quantitative. It doesn't mean I now have, for example, I know so much more information. But it's that this quality of understanding, like this realization, like I, oh, wow, like I, I, I get it now. You know, this, this realization, he calls this the noetic quality of the mystical experience. That, that, and that doesn't happen like that in dreams. It doesn't happen in... Uh, um, and so people that undergo these, see, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, belief, atheist or theist or religious or... Uh, it doesn't matter. Like they all, they all seem to share this thought of well, hmm, that that no, it was it had this profundity to it, and mm. usually it's it's always life changing. Like people give up uh, addictions, 
They and normal things can't do that. I mean, you could like look, medicine struggles for you to be able to give up drugs, for you to be able to um, give up alcohol. It's not easy. Like go, going to or people have other addictions, gambling addictions, other addictions. It's not easy. Like just saying, well, here, take this. Medicine really struggles in the face of addiction to overcome it because it needs willpower. It needs. But yet the majority, I think they cite something like between 70 to 80 percent of people who had a mystical experience and gave up addictions. That they they just gave them up. They just like, you know, they just become a changed person. And, and there's this this what, what is there to that? There's something to that. You can't, you know, to just say that's just in your mind. You just imagined it. It's because why why can't other people just imagine and change? You know the amount of people that go through debilitating you know, life ex conditions and they want to change. Like the people that think my life is crap. I I want to give up alcohol. I want to give up gambling. I want to, but they can't. You know they can't just conjure up an imagination and give it up. So yeah, it's. Um, yeah, there's um, yeah these things. I mean, what 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 what, what else? Anything that was uh, did you? Uh, I'd like to know. Did any of you have a slightly different uh, opinion? To, because before I read it, I guess I was already um, an advocate uh, or somebody who walks the path of consciousness and already quite. Uh, keen on the genre of sacred medicine and psychedelics. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't somebody even neutral. I guess I was already prejudiced or biased, you know, just if we're to use those terms. Uh, I was already a believer. <laughs> you know, this was just <laughs> preaching to the to the congregation. It wasn't, um, I mean, sure, he gave a lot of science and he introduced a lot of background that I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know about some of these studies and I didn't know about some of these figures. And I mean, I'd heard some of their names like Timothy Leary, of course, and Hoffman and R. Gordon Wasson and, and, you know, like these kind of people. But I hadn't heard of some of the other names like Bob Jesse and some of these um so it was really informative and helpful, but were, were any of you prior to this either on the neutral sense or maybe even against and this? Because that would be interesting. I, I'd like to know if where you guys stood prior to this uh, or were you already a believer? <laughs> uh, I yeah. was definitely more skeptical. Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, I was going to say I was, yeah, I was sort of like against before reading the book. Oh, wow. Uh, after actually reading it, so it opened my mind to a different perspective. Oh, wow. Okay, so you would have been on the other side of the fence prior to... That's really interesting because that I really wanted to... Because that, that's... I guess it's in the name of the book, How to Change Your Mind. You know, anybody who wants... Because these are scientists speaking. I mean, they're not... You know, this is not exactly. your... Uh, you know, it's not just some... Lalu Panju just sitting down the, you know, in, it's, it's not, it's, it, these are d dignified, accomplished, professional, mature individuals. They're not a bunch academics. of, yeah, academics and uh, leading people in the world. Some of them professors and, you know, renowned professors. They're not just, and so when, the, when they're writing this, they, they're coming from a very mature angle. So, yeah, okay, but to, to do ex if if you can expand a bit on that, maybe Ibn Firnas, and then also Mas, I'd like to come to you, and in fact, all of you on that, because I think that's uh, an invaluable aspect that where you stood before, or you know, even if it wasn't against, but even if it was, or neutral, or however, and how you found yourself navigating through the book and where you stand now. Yeah, so I'm now reading the book. I was reading certain sections and I'm surprised by the information was given mm -hmm. I went ahead and researched certain aspects of it and it gave me a different view to what I understood it for example cannabis that's not really a psychedelic it's not yeah. um, and you don't get the full experience of a psychedelic anyway once you use it and with the cannabis I was surprised um, what that was from my understanding they've used that 
Cairo, for example, half of the city is built using cannabis. Half of what? So it was half of Cairo. Cairo. Oh, okay. Cairo in Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they, they, yeah, they use the base of to grow cannabis. And with that, they they have different uses, for example, ropes, for example, or other aspects that they use it for. So it's not really a drug. They use it for smoking or... Okay, or I didn't know that. Wow. Of, okay. Yeah, so that was something that I found really, really interesting about it. Uh, they were saying they used, uh, for example, the rope that they used to have. They used it till uh, World War Two, in fact. Wow. So it was the, the cannabis was... kind of what the cannabis branch or something that they use. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, sort of branch. Yeah, yeah. Because so I've sort of I've heard that the hemp can uh, get rid of dangerous carbon emissions. This I've heard some stuff like that online that the hemp to do with uh marijuana uh, results in some kind but i mean i've not explored it yeah. or researched it thoroughly but I, here it does show about cairo for example this half of cairo is built from cannabis and you get some herd that mixed it with lime uh so it sort of, uh, turns into sort of some kind of a stone type material and people okay. built their houses using that wow so that was something interesting uh, and even this day and age, they use it all the way till World War Two, for example, ropes and that kind of stuff. Um, the, and from when I was reading, I was like, uh, this is interesting. Uh, there's a suggestion, for example, that they could use cannabis to replace other materials in the world, uh, sort of like um, construction wise of it. Okay, so that was wow. kind of interesting. I didn't realize it's well. that formidable. OK. Hmm. I I do I would say though just to uh, to caveat that point I do feel that cannabis uh, especially the way it's available which is through the the street to people I feel is often uh, dangerous um, with a lot of uh, especially long term effects of uh, especially in if people if they're not fully um, of age in the sense that at least in their late twenties older. Uh, I feel it damages a lot of the synaptic connections in the brain. It, 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 there's some arguments it can induce schizophrenia in people. There's uh, this is where it's um, uh, it's the the CBD is is definitely shown a lot of um, positive. There's a lot of research showing how the CBD and the, and the cannabinoid receptors within the body obviously benefit from that. And it has a lot of healing thing, I think, in cancer as well and, and other forms and arthritis and uh, sometimes migraines and things like this. But the THC, which is the psychoactive, not psychedelic, but psychoactive uh, element in what especially uh, in, you know, in, in cannabis, it can have certain dangerous effects and especially when it's street you don't know what people are lacing things with um it if anything um would harm people definitely i i feel it would harm most people and some more than others so i wouldn't see uh i wouldn't personally be an advocate of of that and i wouldn't uh, obviously, you're, I'm, I'm just following caveating the, the discussion. I wouldn't put that in the basket of of these things at all. Uh, these things, I don't see them as, uh, generally speaking, at all harmful. I don't see them as... Sure, I accept they're not for everyone, but I don't see fungi and, um, you know, DMT and these kind of things are... Uh, although he does speak a bit about, a bit about he doesn't go too much into DMT uh, uh, in, throughout the book he does speak about it. he does have some sections on it I feel these are a totally separate you know basket of of things we're looking at not so just to be clear because a lot of people equate and I saw in the comments as well they equate cannabis with with this kind of discussion and they think maybe so I just want to be clear on my position. I'm not personally an advocate for cannabis. I'm not. Um, and I've got a video saying that where people are under 20. I know I do have a video saying sometimes it's difficult to prove things to be haram if we don't have categorical evidence in the Quran uh, or the Sunnah. But I've said that under 25, 
um, I would feel it's definitely clearly haram. I mean, the, the damage that it does to the synapse, because the brain hasn't developed. The neuroplasticity doesn't end till about 25. In even, you know, 18 people are grown up, but they're not actually, the brain's still developing. And I think this may be one of the reasons that a lot more young people have depression compared to their older counterparts. Like, so people in their 40s, you'll get people that are depressed, but let's say they, you know, go, going through stuff or whatever, but you'll get young people who are depressed for no reason. Like, there's no reason to be depressed. There's not like, oh, you haven't been sacked from work and this and that. They're just depressed. Like, they've got everything, but they, they're just depressed. They just have a life doesn't seem interesting and I'm uninterested and I'm, I, you know, oh, I'm just down and I'm but I've got no reason to be down but I'm just down and I can't shake it off and I'm and I feel that a lot of this in not maybe not in all but in many of them might be a result of things like weed smoking weed and well, because they're young and it's and it's screwing up their synaptic nerves so they don't have as strong resilient connections in the brain as people a generation older that's my thoughts on that. I just thought it's important because people sometimes mix up and, and I didn't want it. I know in the past people sometimes attribute it to me as well. And so I just wanted to be clear on that. But yeah, coming back to, uh, right, wh what about, so uh, Mas, you were saying you were also quite skeptical. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I knew that you had a lot of videos saying yeah. that no, it's not explicitly haram and you had your reasons for sure, that sure. i think before i read the book i was in a position where i'm like yeah, okay maybe it's not haram but maybe it's not for me like mm. if someone told me they did it i'll be like oh cool i guess um uh, I, I don't have to go do it myself but then after going through the book and all the studies that he cited and i think one thing that sticks out for me is that he mentioned about the internet as we see it today i mean look at what we're doing today we're in six yeah. different locations i think we've got three countries here mm. and many of the continents mines, we've the got mines. three continents yeah yeah oh, so, <laughs> the minds yeah the minds behind the innovation leading to the internet these guys were all on psychedelics in silicon valley and that's yeah. mentioned in the book as well yeah so the inventions are just crazy. Even Steve, jo exactly. Steve Jobs and even the invention of the mouse. He mentions, I've forgotten the guy's name, who, who invents all these things, including the mouse and all of the He does it just on psychedelics. It's crazy. Exactly. Exactly. And how ubiquitous these devices and the Internet has become in everyone's lives, even everyone who hates us and, you know, thinks psychedelics are haram or whatever. They're also on the Internet. They're also using the keyboard and the mouse and all these things. So... I just found that very interesting that psychedelics led to this sort of how do I even explain it because if you look at the internet in particular I wanted to use that as an example that if you think about it and if we didn't have a reference for what we're doing today I mean if you went back like 30 years and you tell people that hey I'm gonna meet up with Mufti Abu Layth in Birmingham tonight uh, and he's in a different time zone and we're gonna talk about this book that we we both read, they'd look at you like you're absolutely crazy. And obviously, if you took psychedelics, I guess, you know, something like that could exist in that realm. Mm. But the internet is sort of how I understand it. It's as if they tried to bring back what they saw mm. there and sort of make it a sort of reality in our world. And <laughs> wow, obviously, it's, yeah. it's not entirely there. As in to kind I, of attempt to interject this exactly. experience into a uh, into technology yeah in other words yeah yeah absolutely i think you hit it on the uh, hail uh, the nail on the head over there so yeah i just found that very interesting and i'm interested to see what else people can do if you know they also go on trips so to speak <sighs> and what else they can bring back from these trips but it's the, you see the scariest thing is for people to lose a grip on their mind because that's, that's very scary, isn't it? Because it's the only thing that holds reality together for us. And even in a few moments to, to loosen your grip on it. You know, it's like, imagine you're hanging. You know, I'm sure we've all been in this position at some point. You know, even as kids, maybe. You're hanging off something to jump. 
and you've got to let go, but you just can't get yourself to let go. <laughs> like, ah, oh, you know, but you've got to let go. And so your mind, you know, you're saying the willpower is saying let go, but it's like saying no, I can't do it. And in in a similar way that to, to loosen your grip, but on on your mind. It's it's a it's a very daunting, and you know I I got into a discussion. I don't know if I mentioned this right. I got into this discussion um, on this retreat I went to uh, in Spain. So there was this lady, a retired uh, GP, um, uh, who you know an accomplished doctor. She's great, and you know done a very almost somewhat hippie like i mean she's retired probably in her late 60s now and she was learning spanish and you know very intelligent and but also traveled the world been all over several parts of europe been to certain parts of africa been to south america to chile to you know mexico to all these different different countries paraguay and i just traveled and you know just wow okay and so we got talking and, and she, she was a doctor and I was like, OK, and she'd worked as a, I think she'd done some GP, but she she'd worked uh, a, a number of years in palliative care. And and she was some consultant or something. And so we started speaking about palliative care and the, and the discussion ended up on psychedelics. Um, because I said that, you know, I feel that it's almost a crime to not have psychedelics available for people on palliative care. So I was really, I, was, I, I guess in some way I was surprised by her reaction because I may not have been surprised if it, if, because maybe the, the reason that surprised me is that, she, I mean, she was ardently against psychedelics, but I, I was somewhat taken aback because of her, if I can say, profile, which somewhat I had stereotyped with a kind of filter of that kind of hippiness. You know, because she, okay, she's somebody who's obviously lived through that whole age. I mean, she's in her late 60s, but she's also traveled the world, you know, done all this. You know, there's some of, somewhat of that, uh, I mean, she was not a hippie, clearly, but you, you get this vibe by some people that are just minimalist and they, they have this kind of style about them and they've been here, you know, I've volunteered in Chile and I've volunteered in certain parts of Africa and I've volunteered here and I've done all of this. And, and you have this, and I, and I assumed, <laughs> you know, Oh, well, you know, you say whenever you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. So the assume. So the the thing is. So I um, so I said, well, uh, she was really against it, and I said, ah, I said, well, okay, why? And she said, well, why would you say that? Why, why not? Why would you say that? But she said, well, why? And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, you couldn't be giving people psychedelics, and and I said, well. Why not? I, and I said to her, no, I said, not giving. I said, making available. So she said, I said, I'm not saying you go around giving it to everyone. I've, I've never said that. That'd be ridiculous. I'm saying available for those who want to explore it. She said, well, she, and her words were, well, she said, well, why would you want, because what, what, why would you want to show them? What, what would it do? So I said, well, Obviously, it's, it would give them that experience. And she said, well, it would be false. It's just an imagination. It's not there. They're just going to see something that's not real. So why, why would you want to show them that? I said, well, I said, well, what makes you so sure it's not real? And she said, well, of course, it's not there. I said, but how do you know it's not there? And she said, well, because it's not. I said, no. I said that you're not, you're talking about the realm of the unconscious, of the conscious, of consciousness. How, show me it's not there. I said, well, it's like saying, well, if we've got this wall, sure, you can say to me that you can't prove that it concretely exists. I'd say, fine, but it's the experience. But to say that you somehow are right and these people's experiences are wrong because I said like if I was to say well what's behind this wall 
And somebody said, well, you know, it's a starry horizon. And somebody else said, no, it's just a table and a chair. Now, let's say for argument's sake, we can't tell. But there's not to say, well, you can say I'm wrong. You know, how can you? And I'm surprised as a person of science that how can... And, but she was really uh, adamant on this point. That I mean, she wasn't necessarily rude, but in this discussion, she was. She said, "Look, you like basically you would these people if they experience it, they would lose a grip of reality, and whatever they would see isn't real." And this was her the gist of the argument that one was. Like they would lose this this grip of reality and it's unpredictable. And I said, but what's to say unpredictable is bad? Just because we've since we've been kids, we've been taught this everything must have order and structure. But what's to say that way is the right way? Just because we're used to and familiar with structure. But maybe, you know, consciousness is not from the realm of structure. And so as as the soul, I mean, OK, because she wasn't a, Muslim, um, a believer in that sense, so I wouldn't use the word soul. But it, but it struck me that how, hmm, I don't know, like I was I was somewhat surprised, maybe because I misread and also because this was a mature person at a later part of their lives who'd worked with people in palliative care who are dying. And I said to her that, but. You see, people have a fear of death. And she said, well, no, because most people are just, they want to die at that stage. This this is what she said. And I said, I can understand that. But that wanting to die is coming from a different place. It's coming from a place of anguish. And, you know, like it's coming from a place of, ah, oh, just have this over and done with. It's not coming from a place of this noetic quality of, wow. You know, like I said, like people that experience this, they welcome that step and that transition into another life. Like it's not it's not the same as like, oh, I'm just, you know, well, I know my life's just going downhill. Just pull the plug. It's a very the, these kind of embracing deaths are two very different embracing deaths. One is like you've just given up on everything. I mean, I didn't say this to her, but yes, you know, like in the Quran, what's condemned? It's as the worst thing that, you know, you, you despair. And the other is like this hope, this bliss. And But her point was that she said, yeah, but I, that, that bliss isn't true. <laughs> it's an illusion. I said, well, you know, I said, well, well hmm. Sorry, what was somebody about to say? Sorry, sorry. Uh, no, please carry on. No, no, <coughs> that, that, no, that, no, that was it. My point was just that, you see, she her her argument was that 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 bliss, this 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 sense of being that you speak of, this c continued um, existence, is an illusion. And my point was simply, well, you know, what's to prove that? Like what's like? Where is your certainty in that? Like I don't understand where that's stemming from. At most, you can I mean, just say we can't prove it. Sure, but it doesn't disprove it. It's not a like it's all you know. It's all in the dark. But these people, their experiences are very real to them. They're not like yeah, exactly yeah. But yeah, sorry, exactly. carry on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so exactly. I think it's regardless of whether. Uh, she thought or one thinks whether or not it whether or not it's real or not uh, or it exists or it's an imag it's imagination and so on and so forth the experience for the person that's experiencing it is very real to them and is life changing and all of that so I mean isn't that what is of like uh, most importance at the end of, at the end of the day you know the experience for the person experiencing it is very real so um, so that's what matters really for them, you know. It's real to them, so it may not be real to you. Or and to it's else. and it's more than just, you see, because some people use this argument here. They say, "Yeah, well, you know, if somebody said, uh, I just, you know, there's a, you know, the spaghetti monster out there, and it gives me comfort knowing this, and you know, then um, fine, you know, <laughs> would you agree that sure, you know, like let's all just play along because it gives you comfort, and." 
I feel that these are completely, you know, it's completely misplaced arguments because the mystical, profound experience that these people have isn't just like some kind of a, you know, like a silly uh, notion or an idea or a delusion in the sense like, um, I, I remember Sam Harris in one of his arguments, uh, he said, um, he said, like, if if I was to believe that, uh, I think he said, if I was to believe that uh, Angelina Jolie uh, is married to me really, even though the world doesn't know it, and she loves me to bits, and this belief has made me a better person, you know, like I'm a... Uh, I'm, you know, I do more, I help people and I give more to charity because, you know, because Angelina Jolie loves me and she's my wife. And so, I, you know, now I'm this great human being. So uh, what's wrong with just going along with that, that she is my wife and I am married to her because it's made me a better person. And his whole point is to say, well, you know, but it's not true. So it doesn't, you know, you have to, you can't, it's a delusion. And he's trying to, he's obviously equating that to this whole, to the greater picture of faith. That, and, and But this experience as well of faith. But I would say, you see, there's a big difference in a delusional state of belief and in a mystical experience are two very different things. So if a person just says, look, oh, I'm, uh, you know, oh, I'm, uh, my name is this, I'm, I, I'm this kind of, you know, they've just got a delusion of something because it helps them to, to, to do something. It's not the same as an experience because the people who have these experiences are not delusional. They're not. So, so for example, the people who experience, let's say they take uh, mushrooms or they take DMT and they go, they know that physically I was still here. They know that, you know, they're not like, so let's say in this experience, you are somewhere else in this different world made up of colors and different beings. And uh, you come, you experience something and it's profound. Like one of them said in the book, I saw the creation of the world and the Big Bang, and I saw uh, my parents, and I saw me being born, and I saw all these things. Now, he, he knows that at that time, he was sit. let's say he was sitting in this chair doing it. He knows that his body was here. You know, he's not delusional. If you're to ask him, oh, were you 14 billion years ago there in the, is that where you were? Like, he would say, no, like, I know that's uh, like, I, I experienced that, you know, through my consciousness or soul or mind, but I physically was here. I, he's not delusional. He's not like this person isn't, they can't, it's not, they don't know what's real. They know what's real. They, he knows that, oh no, look, I'm actually here. I'm this, I'm, whereas a delusional person doesn't know that. Like they think they are that thing and that thing was real and they can't differentiate between the reality and between what's, what they, what they think is reality. So these are, you know, in Arabic, we have this term, qiyas al It's like a misplaced analogy and it's false because it's these, uh, to associate people with these exper mystical experiences or and they may be experiences of faith or of sacred medicine with delusional people. It just doesn't, it's not the same. Like these people are not delusional. They're not like they know exactly what's going on. They can tell you, yes, I had this. I did this. Yes, this is my name. I'm not that, you know, I'd, my age is not from the beginning of the Big Bang just because I feel I experienced the Big Bang. That's not. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just thought that's um, hmm, it's an it's an important point. But yeah, so Imi, what? what? You... Yeah, yeah, sorry. No. Yeah. Carry on, carry on. Um, well, I just wanted to ask Mufti, would you say then it's not a delusion, but it still requires a leap of faith in that sense? And perhaps this is what the mystical aspect, which was being alluded to in the book, that it's not just purely materialistic and scientific. There is a mystical aspect that you can't actually put in materialistic and scientific terms when you're dealing with psychedelics. And perhaps yeah, that's... what yourself and uh, Artek have been speaking to is basically that i mean yeah i wonder what your rest of you feel about that you see because i wouldn't feel it's a thing of faith like as in i feel it's a thing of experience like a dhok. 
Um, yeah. Even if you didn't have faith, like many atheists don't believe in anything, but they take DMT and they're like, what the hell? You know, there's definitely something. I, I experienced it. Like, but I didn't actually have any faith or anything, but I experienced it. And so I, I personally would think it's something of dhok. Like in Arabic, the, the mystics, you know, the Muslim mystics use this word a lot. A dhok, something to taste, something, experience. Um, as opposed to it being, but I don't know, what, what do you guys feel? Do, do you feel it's faith? Uh, is a core ingredient to it. I don't. I, I don't feel like it's interesting because it's almost as if well, there's different levels to to it almost, and it's and it's uh, people of faith or people of people of faith would 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 obviously claim that yes, faith is a massive part of it because it's from God. And it's this kind of like mystical experience, that profound experience that you wouldn't normally experience. So it's kind of God given or mm. so on and so forth. But, but, would you, but would you feel that's the um, that's the result or the meaning or but could you experience it without? As absolutely. In, yeah, and yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, I feel like you could and people, uh, I mean, clearly people have, you know, mm. from reading the book, people that don't necessarily believe in. Uh, anything like you said they they take psychedelics and they believe they feel like yeah something is out there so 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 it's interesting i think it, i think i completely agree with the whole the whole thing that you mentioned i think it literally if you have an inclination towards it almost mm. and um, i would I, I would say that if you have faith then you could probably take this this experience for you could go so much further because you already have a structure to give meaning to. So it's like, like you get people who, let's say they're atheists and they experience something now and they think, what the hell, that was so real. It wasn't like a dream. It was like so real. And let's say I experienced the presence of God. And they, but, then, but then they're like, well, okay, what do I make of this? Because, hmm, because I don't really believe in a God, but then... I don't know now. And then they're like, well, I don't want to really be a part of any religion. So hmm, maybe I'll just be a bit spiritual without being. Whereas let's say you already had a faith. You had Iman. Now, if you experienced it, it would it would just boost the fact that you have Iman. Like, let's say you felt you're in the presence of God. You felt the presence of God. Now, because you already believe in God, and you already have this it it would i just feel that this it would propel that experience so much further and you'd be like wow this is so amazing now i understand you know when people said fana filla and you know these kind of you had these mystic islamic terms of uh perishing in the presence of god like this ego death thing that they spoke of al fana which is like just destruction like perishing absolutely uh fill and you think oh wow now i understand it or now i understand what they meant by this and whereas if you had none of this already then you're kind of having to invent the wheel now and and you're also weary about taking on baggage because atheists don't want to take on anything from religion so they so it's i feel that's a different challenge they have then how do you um uh, you know, yeah, move it's interesting. Forward. Yeah. You know, Bulle Shah uh, yeah. says a very famous Punjabi way, like Baj Fakira Kisin Ne Maria Zalam Chor Andarda. And wow. it's like the, and that's referring to almost like the ego death as well. Like, imagine yeah. you have this like ego death, and it's like, okay, it's like this whole path of mysticism that the Sufis talk of. Yeah. Um, and what Rumi speaks of, and you know, Shah Abdul Latif Bittai Rahmatullah, what he speaks of. So yeah. it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, and Bulle Shah, I think, is an amazing, honestly, an inspiration that is so much more needed in, in this day and age with all the... Because it's... Because I think even the path of psychedelics, it's interesting because it's almost an iconoclast, a, iconoclastic path. It's one against the idols of old. You know, it's like against institutionalization. It's against... You know, even in, for the scientists, it's like even for these guys, it's like he's saying, look, after so many years, it's now opening up again. Like we can talk about it. It's not, you know, first your funding would get cut. You'd get, you know, 
blacklist you'd get removed you'd lose posts you'd lose a job you'd lose but now it's kind of coming back as in you're allowed to talk about it you're allowed to it hasn't this iconoclastic path which is against institution and people like Bulle Shah are very much icons of that you know iconoclastic uh, mission like we're against institution uh, mm. institutionalization of stuff and you know just worry about yourself not about this you know be to be grounded and yeah 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 certainly there, there was uh I, I was about to um you know, when I was saying that, there was something that just came on my mind to... Uh, <laughs> what was it we... Uh, there's a quote he brings of uh, Jung, where uh, where Jung says that the numinous experience... Because this whole experience, uh, Jung calls it the numinous, you know, this uh, mystical, um, spiritual experience. Um he gives it the term, and one could get it by just looking at the starry sky. You know, somebody could look at the starry sky and have a numinous experience. Um, but obviously it's much more profound um, on such a path. Jung speaks about that the numinous experience can help an individual uh, navigate the latter middle part of their lives you know the latter part of their lives so especially as a person approaches maybe 40 he feels onwards that there there is a different tool that they need to navigate that part of the life you know like you've got the so it's like um almost like a like a rocket going into space so it has these these powered jets that are kind of taking it off the ground. And this is your younger part of life. It's driven with all this ambition to, you know, I need to do this. I need to achieve. I need money. I need a relationship. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need a career. I need this. And it's kind of like this rocket going into trying to leave the, the atmosphere of Earth. But then it jettisons this as, you, as you're almost approaching you, the, your midlife. You see, and what takes you further is a different drive then. It's no longer like these drives. I mean, sure, maybe for some people they still use these drives. But what Carl Jung was trying to say was that that numinous experience, it can be incredibly helpful for individuals to navigate the latter part of their lives, that, that, that latter half of their lives, because... It gives them this meaning that they didn't have before. This, um, yeah, so I thought that was uh, really profound. Um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting how the author said that he first thought about doing them when he was uh, nearing 60 years old and that um, the psychedelics might be like wasted on people who took them like at an yeah. immature age. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool how um, he used them as a way to reprogram your mind and reprogram your habits and stuff like that. I, I would second that, you know, 100% what, what you just said, Scorpio, because I, I would feel that they are really, they really give meaning for people as they approach maybe the midlife. And, you know, this is this this statement of Jung that there is, I feel sometimes, sure, they may help people even when they're a bit younger, but, but I just feel sometimes that maybe people are not, you know, they're not right in, a, in that. I'm sorry, it's not that the people are not right, but the, the timing is maladjusted because that numinous experience might be wasted and it may it may not be um synergetic with the drives that they need at that stage of life so like let's say a person in their 20s i know atikia is in his 20s but let's say a person in their 20s they 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 they, they needs to be this fire in the belly you know like you need to be very ambitious and trying to do things and trying to achieve and try and it's almost uh, very uh, counterplaced to this stillness and calmness 
and being in love with humanity and and the environment and and you know it's very it's it's like it's almost mismatched for that stage of life where a person needs to be quite uh, go getting and you know like competitive and um because they because they, they're still at that you know it's like it hasn't it hasn't escaped the atmosphere yet so it needs that fire in the rocket and whereas the the numinous experience is a very calm tranquil you know it doesn't matter you know you don't money is not everything <laughs> you know it's not you know these things are just be at one and it's it's like a very different maqam i'm not to say maybe some people manage that very well maybe some people maybe it'll mature people much before they that age and but i i totally understand you know when when you just said that that this is exactly what i was understanding from when when he quotes carl jung on it helps with the latter half of people's lives in navigating through that because they need a different meaning and a different drive and um yeah i i wonder i wonder maybe it doesn't you know we need younger people's input on that that how they of uh, us old souls or i speak for myself all of you young dynamic people but uh, this old soul now i'm i'm in that latter part of the life so it's it's a bit different here <laughs> you guys on that side of the fence still needing all that that rocket fuel <laughs> uh, but yeah maybe it's still i'm i'm sure it still does a lot of uh, of goodness and khair sure uh, i mean it must be crazy in uh, like you think of the south american cultures uh, growing up i mean uh, not in the, in the cities but in especially the traditional kind of the that the culture where they would the shamanic practices where they'll give it to children i'm sure growing up and especially teenagers and i wonder how it must be like for them having grown up on dmt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. So some some concluding thoughts, people. What what do you what, what do you what do you feel? Is this is this uh, book definitely something you'd recommend? And um, has it given you some food for other thoughts to explore certain things? Or what? Some concluding um, remarks, people. I'll put it out there to you. If anything, um, I think it's really helped. I know this is going to sound a bit weird, but it's really no, helped. No, no, nothing sounds me weird after you've read after you've uh, read this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, like it's really helped helped me personally um, connect with nature almost um, mm. appreciate because in the book there's this like theme of this like plantide vision that the people experience, and it's like it's as if they see plants for the first time again, as they, wow. they see trees, yeah. and it's like if they've never seen trees before and it's like oh now i actually can see trees and it's almost so like oh, the importance of just going going back to nature and spending time and uh, sound around. sound yeah exactly like you hear sound for the, you know you hear it's, wow is that what music is i yeah, never knew what yeah. music was is that what it is yeah, wow. like, like, like they become like the, the notes the they, harmony they you're like is chords. that is that the vibration <laughs> it's like yeah, they, it's a different world they become yeah. the music they become yeah. the music, you know. That's yeah. crazy. So that, so all of that, I mean, definitely, you yeah, definitely recommend the book to, to anyone. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a, um, there's a a track. What's it called? Yeah, it's very famous. You know, it's a a, a Sufi. Um, it was a Coke Studio rendition. Is it a Ball Ball Who or something? Ball What's it? You know, the famous Sorch. Yeah. Sorch. Yeah. What's it called? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Bolhu. Bolhu or something, yeah. And the little girl sings. The little girl at the end. Have you have you heard yeah, it? I, yeah, I, right. I've not. I've not heard it. Before. Right, you know what? When we finish this, you guys have to hear that. Actually, maybe that, I have. Yes. That you know that little girl that sings. She she must yeah, be like yeah, eight yeah. years old or nine years old. Not even nine. I think she must be about eight or seven. Wow. You know, and she goes, Allah, and it just, you, wow, honestly, you, it is, that is, it brings tears to your eyes. It's, it's just something, man. And, and things like that. 
It's you have to, you know. I obviously it's I can't play it here; it'd be copyrighted, so we just get flagged. But it's <laughs> you have to. Everybody that listens to this, you have to listen to it, and you have to listen to it like at least like play, you know, on some earphones or something, or uh, where where you're not being disturbed. And oh my God, it is so profound, and the lyrics are incredible. You know, the lyrics, obviously, it's in Urdu, but it's a Qawwali thing. It's about Allah and Insan and the point where she comes in. And I didn't realize, because you've got the main singer and he's he's good. He's good. But sh- she is just gifted by God, honestly. that, And you could see in the comments, it made so many people just cry. And I thought, wow, what this woman, oh, not woman, this little girl what she did with her voice just you know when she, she there's a point where she cr- cries out the i mean she doesn't cry but she, she kind of s- sings out just the name of allah and it, honestly the, the the hairs will stand on your body and i thought what she does in just spreading the the, the name of god probably so many people couldn't with with that one like she, she people Honestly, I mean, in the hundreds of thousands and in the millions, probably they, but at least in the hundreds of thousands, probably cried like it by just hearing that. And it's things like that as well. If if you could hear them on in an altered state of consciousness, it is, it is just totally something else. I mean, you, you, you your life would be like, you'd be totally, just taken into a different realm. But yeah. Wow. But people, it's uh, yes. Any concluding remarks? Would you definitely recommend the book? Would you feel, uh, and we're not on any commission. We should be. I, I, <laughs> Michael Pollan should bloody. <laughs> uh, we should at least yeah. get a free batch supply of uh, at least some healthy mushrooms sent out to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but we're not on any, but I, I would definitely recommend it to people. I think it's a very, you know, and just stay with it. I, my thoughts would be that, look, just stay with it. it. In between, I did feel it was a bit stretched, uh, but it's well worth it. You know, as you reach the end, you've been on this whole journey with the author, I felt. Um, and, and really decades worth of uh, experiences, literature, research, the John Hopkins Project, Harvard, the rise and fall of these celebrity uh, psychedelic stars like uh, Timothy Leary and and all these people, the, the journey from Aldous Huxley to Hoffman to... Um, he mentions the point of when Hoffman is high on his LSD and rides home on his bike. And every year till today, they celebrate that day and people try to ride on their bike, mimicking that trip of his, I think, in Cambridge or somewhere he did it. But um, but but yeah, so for me, I would say people, it doesn't matter even if you're not. Uh, and I, uh, my, my concluding thoughts would be that, look, uh, I don't feel people need to, they need to be with it. Like I, I would not, I'm not... Pr- proselytizing even though i'm sure my words feel maybe like that to people if somebody feels this is not for them it's not for them to me it's that this path it chooses people you know it's not so much of you choosing it it will choose you and so don't feel that you have to kind of admire it or you have to walk the path or you have to experience it sure for those that they find themselves on the path they will just take the next step for those who don't it's fine but i would definitely advise getting the the book reading it or listening to it on audible or at least watching his his kind of lectures on youtube he's got some lectures got some ted talks michael pollan that's my uh, concluding thing to, to just take it with a you know it's a professional opinion from scientists with all this history being summed up for you in just um a few hours Yep. Uh, I'll, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Just the, the, um, we spoke about it earlier, but for well, for me, I would definitely recommend the book, and or I really enjoyed the listen. Um, you know, one thing that really struck with me was the whole uh, what we just spoke about, like the mystical aspect of it. Uh, I grew up like in a Sufi kind of yeah. environment in a Tarika, and you know, just like the, the descriptions that they were giving were so so similar to the you know it kind of felt like they're describing the same thing as the sufi zok experience um 
and but just in their own words like one of the most uh catchy phrases that i will never forget from the book was when someone said they felt like they got uh, sent to the asshole of god uh, so. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that will be very, very blasphemous for many people. Uh, you're right. What uh, he does cite that in the book somewhere. I forgot which uh, uh, who it is that he's quoting when he says that. But yeah, anyway, yes, yeah, c carry but, on. You know, that's their that's their way their, of their way of expressing it. it. Yeah, yeah. Right. He was, the same yeah. thing, but. Um, uh, but also, I just want to mention, like, for those who don't want to do it, and but are kind of looking for the experience, there's other ways to come to the same experience as well through meditation, through breathing. Uh, yeah. It's not the only. It's not yeah. the only path. Yeah. And he mentions there's some one of the researchers I've forgotten who, after the whole shutdown on psychedelics, he goes into holotropic uh, br breathing. That's his whole thing of trying of bringing that thing through. And there's a lot of breath work. Uh, stuff out there you know resources on um, on DMT breathing or ho holotropic breathing and how to kind of ha bring that calmness and this altered state of consciousness there, there's a lot on YouTube for that yeah uh, rest of you guys your, your, your any thoughts any concluding I just wanted to add um, like I was also kind of skeptical like I, I guess I was neutral um, mm. when I started reading the book but I really liked how they cited their research and they went into the history of when the drugs were discovered. And I would encourage anyone who already has like negative connotations attached with the word psychedelic, like maybe think about why you don't like them or think about who told you or who influenced you to believe that they're bad or they're dangerous to just look into that so you know where it's coming from and then read the history and see maybe you know the drug war that's still a failed drug war on many other drugs right now maybe that influenced it you know so i think that was my key takeaway that they are being used um in research right now and it's difficult to do more research if there's just a an all outright ban on everything you know so I think it the, the the book definitely changed my mind towards the end. Um, I'm excited to see new research. I know that where I live, they are doing ketamine therapy, okay. which the book sort of mm -hmm. talked about, um, like how the anesthetics, they don't allow you to remember, but it's a lower dose of the ketamine. Mm -hmm. So you are able to be a bit conscious. Um, it's set up in the same exact way as like a, mm -hmm. like a psychedelic session with a guide and you have to do research. It's mainly used for depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. but I really liked all the research, especially towards the, um, I liked the history chapter and I liked the the neuroscience chapter and like further research, and it definitely did change my mind. So. Uh, the cer certain ones because because you mentioned ketamine, I was just going to say that that's not usually the, the uh, like a psychedelic in that sense. No. Um, it's more no, like an anesthetic, an anesthetic, and I think even yeah. like arguably like a horse tranquilizer or something. I think it may have been used. As... Uh, no, it's used in in humans. It's also yeah. used in veterinary yeah, medicine. Yeah, in, in animals um, as well. Isn't it? Yeah, but like I think that's uh, highly addictive as well, ketamine. Um, I'm not sure if it's yeah. how addictive it is. It's usually only used um like in very severe cases, but mm. now there's like um there is I think the FDA recently approved a nasal spray which is a very low low mm, dose. Yeah. For, because um treatment resistant depression. Yeah, because there is a lot of abuse with ketamine and ketamine is usually um just associated more with uh yeah. drugs for people who for right, example right. crack cocaine and some people on ketamine to get to numb all the pain and it's not right. um a group usually so i just thought i'll just caveat that but yeah yeah it's definitely not a psychedelic yeah 
So, but there has been, there are a lot of places now that are allowing for this certain grants and certain permissions and licenses to uh, have clinical trials with psychedelics, like certain, or the chemical compound, like psilocybin, for example, from mushrooms, uh, is being used because they can't seem to walk away from the literature showing, the evidence showing it, it helps with depression. So there right. are certain, uh, even in the UK, I think there's uh, certain trials that have been um, now approved, clinical trials. And I think in the States, definitely, I think in the States, they they did it probably before in some of the States, before the UK and in Europe. Yeah, I think in the end, it, it does mention a couple of yeah. ongoing uh, clinical studies that are going. So those are very exciting. And also, I was just going to just bounce off one of the points that you you made as well that you, you know what you said as a remark i thought that was invaluable that you said look to people to kind of introspect that why do they feel something is bad and just to kind of uh just to kind of add to that point um you see i personally feel that this is my personal take that when i speak of sacred medicines i'm always very inclined towards psilocybin which is mushrooms or dmt um that which are both entirely found in nature now lsd the thing about it even though it's it's a chemical synthesis of what is meant to be ergot which was a fungi developing on on kind of staple diets and stuff so i guess it's mimicking something that was found in nature but itself is actually synthetic it's not um you know actually something found in nature but it's meant to mimic the ergot uh or part of the ergot. this is why i have sometimes been a bit not skeptical but reserved with lsd and often when i've spoken to people they that when they say or oh, what makes you know why do you feel like what where are your negative opinions coming towards psychedelics often i found it's lsd like people say yeah because you know i've known in uni such and such person took lsd and he was off his head and you know he was like running around and i think somebody put in the comments somebody took lsd and they took their clothes off and uh and i've just always felt this the lsd i've just always had reservations with and and the reason, you know, it's fascinating that if you think of it, they use, like for, a, he, he quotes it in the book because a lot of it speaks of LSD actually in the book. Uh, he, he They use like, let's say a dose, which is a, like a clear, like it's a clear dose for a trip. It's going to be 200, what what, what do they call it? Micro, um, the 200, how do they measure it? It's a, uh, they measure it not, it's a thousand of a milligram or something. What, what, do we, what do we call that? But they, 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 does anybody remember that? This is me, my thing's kicking in. But what they measure, it's, it's, it's in a tight, is it, it's not I use. Is it I use? No, they don't measure it in I use, do they? Or do they measure it in I use LSD? But the, the dosage is like a thousandth of a, if I'm correct, of like, it's like absolutely tiny, but it'll be 200. They, they call it 200. I, I can't, let's see if somebody's put it in the comments, actually. Um, right. Let me show us here. It's measured in micrograms. That's 1,000 of a milligram. Yeah, so I think it is micrograms. That's it, yeah. So, um, right, so I can see some people have just said, well, there's some bots in the comment. Uh, okay, so they should have been... Uh, I can see... Yeah, so it is in... Uh, um, okay, I've just... Uh, okay. Right, so there's... Um, it is in micrograms. And, and just look at that quantity. That's like, like a thousand of a milligram. And they use... Okay, 200... That, that's like invisible almost to the eye almost like it's so and it's so powerful still um so i just feel that when something is that powerful at such a speck of a level it's easily it could be easily abused as in overdosed and um you know it's anything like if you if a person like like imagine right now you took uh caffeine you took like 
you know, a thousand, uh, what is it, milligrams of <coughs> caffeine, or you took even sugar, let's say you took sugar so much of it, or fat, you just consumed. Anything that is over dosing, even if it's, <coughs> even if they're help, okay in and of themselves, like sugar or fat, I mean, you can, the body can handle fat, but if you took so much of it right now, it would, you know, it could have like catastrophic kind of effects. And so I, I've always just been personally, this is my personal thing, reserved on LSD because of how, um, at one, it's always, it's chem it's artificial. It's not the, the natural thing found in nature. And two, just because of how potential, uh, its potency is so powerful. It, and because it's being made and they, they put them in little papers, it's, you know, like if, if it's a higher dose or people take and people can't believe, you see, when something's so tiny, you can't believe it will do that to you. Like if I gave you something that's just so tiny on your finger and, and you can think, oh, this is nothing. You know, like, whereas imagine you're eating mushrooms, you're eating five grams of them. Now, okay, that's a dose to, and and you can kind of believe that, okay, this is might, this might do something. But if there's a tiny speck, like you just got a tiny piece of paper and you kind of put it on your tongue, you're going to think, well, what the hell is that going to do? You know, like, what the hell is a tiny... And so the... the um, the, the 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 assumption to underestimate it is 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 very uh, strong because you think well this can't I, I can take another one it won't do anything you know, it's just so tiny oh give me a bunch and then I think you could just have this bizarre kind of like <laughs> you know and not just ego death but <laughs> like about ten like a mega ego ego death so I just feel that that's like uh, it could be quite so usually when I've spoken to people when uh, when they've you know this question that you asked Scorpio that they say well what made you have this bad impression a lot of people say well oh when I was at uni there was this person who took LSD and and I find LSD is often the the kind of culprit thing that has put off certain not always but when I've spoken to people it's put off a certain number of people so I just wanted to say that that especially uh, he does speak a lot as well about mushrooms and a certain amount about DMT he does speak about LSD as well a lot but um, yeah you do have it's not just LSD it's the more natural ones like psilocybin uh, which is in mushrooms fungi and also DMT stuff. Guys, any concluding thoughts? Um, yep. Yeah, uh, I read a book for me, it was personally, I would say a psychedelic experience in itself. Uh, there was a lot of information uh, that I basically, when, before I read it, I just got rid of any preconceived notions that I had about it and just let myself flow into it. As I was reading and getting further information, I went back and forward from different sources to get more information to build a better picture, uh, to be honest with you. So initially, I was reserved about it. I mean, after reading it, it is, you know, I've sort of changed. Maybe there is something there, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, medically, it looks like just there is some sort of medical benefit there. And at the moment, they're still, I think, filing um, in the hospital. And actually, you can sign up for these um, trials anyway, to be honest with you, to get the help oh. you need there. So maybe okay. from the medical side of it, it won't be viewed negative in the future. It might be something that's mm -hmm. quite normal. Um, uh, I, so, I, yeah, for me, yeah. the caffeine side was interesting because when I was, when I was reading it, um, I was like, uh, okay, there's caffeine there. How does caffeine affect you? So instead of the psychedelic itself, how does caffeine affect you? So I've, the neuroscience of it, obviously, looked at it was interesting. Now, one thing I, I found interesting was I was making my tea, for example, a tea bag. I used to leave it in the cup for five minutes, let it infuse a bit, and okay. then drink it. Uh, okay. And so that was interesting. That was doing the right thing there. <laughs> oh, right. The yeah, I've, I've, I've been, yeah, I've, I watched something on YouTube a couple of years ago saying yeah leave the tea bag in for a little while and allow it to and then i was like oh am i been making my tea wrong and since then i, I uh, <laughs> i've been doing that as well yeah, for a so few I've, minutes I've, I've, yeah that's what i've been doing now uh the other thing that i found interesting uh was it's opened me up to a lot more usually when we eat food 
we look at the health benefits of it and this time I'm more open to the mind what does happen what happens to my mind when I eat this food is it good for me for the pain is it bad for me is it good for my mood bad for my mood or uh, how does it af affect me so that's the interesting part on it um, so yeah it's it sort of changed me a bit more uh, to what I'm consuming uh, so yeah it's not necessarily the psychedelic side of it but I would say it has that uh, the effect where I'm looking at regular food and drinks how does that affect me uh, in terms of how I'm consuming it in terms of the tea part that I was interested because of the caffeine part because usually I have that in the morning uh, how does it affect me how much caffeine should I have how does it work how much uh, caffeine so should you have how much caffeine should you have well well, caffeine-wise, 400 milligrams is what's recommended daily, no more than that. That's, I, that's thought, the I thought the cap so was at about, uh, like, about, what? what is it, well, 1,000. That was the no, no, cap. No, the, the no, no, I think it's, it's 400 is what they recommend. Oh, oh recommend, so sorry, oh, recommend, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, yes, recommend. I thought yes, you meant, because I... Yeah. yeah. So the tea is 50 milligrams, for example, if you have a cup of tea. Whereas standard Red Bull, for example, one of these energy drinks is about 80, I think it says on the can anyway. Yeah, 80, I uh, think. On yeah. standard one. Whereas a coffee might be 150 to 200, depending on how strong you have it. Okay, I would have thought probably a coffee might be about 100, 120, maybe. Maybe even 80, yeah, some if they're a bit light. How strong you have it, yeah, as oh. I mentioned. It could be maybe 100, maybe double the power or the strength you could say of tea itself. oh yeah 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 coffee is one of those things that once you get onto it it's tea just doesn't hit that spot anymore it's like it's like yeah where's my coffee <laughs> yeah, this is what i've got tonight i've got this i've got that you know something <laughs> I, I i i really regret uh i i used to drink a lot of energy drinks before Several years back, you know, if you, if you see my old Monday nights with Mufti, I used to always have energy drinks and Red Bulls and uh, a lot of Coke. And uh, I really regretted that because what it did was um, it really messed up the acid reflux thing. Uh, and then for about a year and a half now, I've been um, trying to undo a lot of that so i don't really i mean maybe occasionally i might have like an energy drink like if i go to a gym and i'm feeling a bit low i might just get one um like a small kind of one so it's just got the energy and not so much of all that gas and acidity but um yeah but i mean i have coffee which still i guess isn't that good for acid uh, acidity and acid reflux but otherwise i really cut out a lot of these fizzy drinks and really upped my water intake I tr you know try to drink if I can water at least. Out, the water there. So that's my yeah, water, which yeah. is hot. Like I think it's probably more than five. Aim, so I aim think about for. Two a day. Yeah, I was gonna say aim for between two to three liters per day. I I like when I wake up, I I drink like about a, a liter. Like I have like two pints of water just as I as I wake up every day, um, and it's. Yeah, I, I just feel, but I was just saying that there, were, there was a time in a different lifetime where I used to be like, you know, with those energy drinks. When I saw it, I was like, oh, I remember those days. <laughs> but it's, I realized it's not really, I mean, for me anyway, it was quite unhealthy. But yeah, uh, Atik, any uh, final, uh, not any final, but any concluding words? It's not like uh, <laughs> uh, ultimas palabras. <laughs> any <laughs> final any final wish <laughs> oh, man, I've got too many too many um, really uh, final remarks really I mean you guys have kind of summed it up brilliantly we've had a really good discussion on it I've just um, been loving the way you know the, the mic Scorpio's mic has just been really outdoing <laughs> all of us on this psychedelic feel on the mood <laughs> she's really yeah she's really getting us into the plot, into plot the twist mood. for the audience that the the mic actually has not changed color that's actually your perception listening to us <laughs> this you guys have been tripping <laughs> this is it's all in the mind that that's just been that's just a solid white color that's what that's all it is. <laughs> exactly mm -hmm. uh yeah yeah no so i mean yeah you guys have said everything brilliantly um you know i'm, I'm excited to to hear more from the author and uh, there's a lot of interesting youtube clips that i think you shared one as well i uh, definitely recommend listening to him 
and his talks. And I think it's, if anything, it expands the mind, regardless of whether or not, you know, taking them or not, it's a separate conversation. Yeah. It's, I think even just talking about uh, these, these topics and exploring what they mean for people and what they do for people, the effects that they may have, uh, it's, it's, it's really expanding your mind, which is, which is great and very important for us to do, especially in this society growing up yeah. uh, in this kind of new way of thinking. Yeah. Right. Well, shukran, guys. I really appreciate you taking out all this time today and, um, you know, especially with some of the tech issues we're having, your patience so and sharing your thoughts and experiences, really navigating through this book. I will. Uh, I look forward to the next book. I will share my thoughts on that because um, I was I was thinking, well, we've done a to, part of the, the flavor. We've done uh, some things. Obviously, these themes, science, science is obviously a strong theme, which we always come back to. In, but uh, to, to kind of change the, the flow in between, we've had certain uh, novels in the past, like uh, Brave New World. We've had other you know, themes like money. We've had evolution. We've had uh, the brain. We've had this. We've had uh, so, you know, just a bunch of different kind of flavors. And I thought, well, the one I'd like to, this was uh, to, to just spice it up for next next month's book, or this month's book, sorry, um, is take the novel, right, uh, Don Quixote. All right, so this, it's, and, and maybe my trip to Spain was what kind of had me thinking about that. So, and I'll speak more about that in our kind of uh, Discord group as well. But why this this book? Because I thought it's going to be really fascinating, and and you know we can take uh, there's obviously the unabridged version. There's abridged versions as well, so it's a classic. It's considered one of the leading um, literary texts in Western literature, and what paved the way for lit literature. And it's actually, I mean, in essence, uh, Don Quixote is uh, this individual who he's. Is, 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 the book is written by uh, Miguel de Cervantes, who's a Spanish author from, um, I believe, the 16th century. So, and the book is about an individual who lives in this village and he's got a mundane life. But he really believes that, he, like, at a certain stage in his life, he's reached an older age and he wants to go on an adventure. Like, he realises, I... Uh, and he wants to uh, this, this 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 adventure. He's heard of all these things of stories of knights and and princesses and all these things. And and he wants to uh, he hears of this woman. Uh, uh, and there's an interplay of realism and surrealism because he is just this normal nobody, but he conjures up this image that he's actually this knight, Don Quixote, and he's going to. Uh, go on this mission, an adventure to rescue this woman who, and the name is this real woman's name, but she's not a princess, but in his mind, she's this princess. And he sets off on this adventure, and along the way, he he, he tries to actually enact these things, like certain battles of, and, you know, gallantry and bravery. and But the reality, it's kind of juxtaposed. It's not actually those things that he, it's it's quite delusional. Uh, in the sense that he's like he, he's meeting these people but they're not these villains and they're not these but in his mind it's this and it's interesting seeing this because the author is telling you that this is quite delusional but it's also giving him meaning and how he sets off on this whole journey to for this princess which is quite uh, most of it in his mind and and then how he comes to terms with it in the end of his life and what he takes as meaning from it. And uh, it's really, I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion from a philosophical and psychological perspective as well, and anthropological. You know, Cervantes is writing this uh, over 400 years ago. And so w how people, even in this day and age, uh, maybe we live these lives in our mind and what kind of meaning we take from it. and. Um, and then is it actually all futile? Should it be something that should be shut down? But 
what if it is giving this meaning because this adventure is something that is it's kind of lighting up your life and so I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion and there's a lot of uh, I'll be sharing uh, you know quite a few resources as well on it on uh, the discord channel some lectures and things and and there's a uh, different version I mean there's like a bridge versions as well of the text but that's some food for thought uh, so something a bit uh, once again a bit novel like I mean not a bit it is a, a novel but it's got underlying deep philosophical profound concepts at play a bit like how brave new world did so guys with that i'll wrap it up shukran once again for your precious time may allah bless you all and we'll catch up so and to our viewers as well do remember to like and subscribe people and we'll be seeing you all very soon take very good care of yourselves assalamu alaikum wa khuda hafiz